So I got to confess to you as we begin today that I have an ongoing problem in my life that I need to confess. I love to open the sermon that way. Because guess what? No one's falling asleep right now. Because when pastor starts that way, we're all interested, right? Here's the deal. Like, we move to this area. We need to buy a home, right? So we get a home. One of the things that I had committed to my kids, in Napoleon, we had come to a place where each one of my four kids had a bedroom, all right? And so then I look at them and say, hey, guys, we're going to a new place. And one of the commitments I made to them was, if we're going to a new place, I'm not changing the fact that you get your own room. But guess what? I got four kids. And Nicole and I, we do share a bedroom. So, <laughs> so we need five bedrooms, right? And so we find a place that's it's great for us. The thing is, it has four, right? It's hard to find a five-bedroom house. So uh, one of the things I did, we, we get the house, and in the basement, is we're able to uh, put a room up. And uh, so I use all my, my expertise in building and manufacturing. And uh, no, I can do a few things. And so I construct a room. And I, uh, the studs go up, hang the drywall, paint. And it's a place for Keegan to, to live, right? That's his room. I'm meeting that commitment. Uh, it's, it's a sweet pad in the basement, right? I'm just hopeful that he doesn't get so used to it that he's 24 in my basement. <laughs> <laughs> Some of you know what I'm talking about, right? I should have made it not as nice down there because it's really convenient. But, like, but if you were to walk in that room today, one of the first things you would say is, oh, this is a nice space, but this isn't finished because guess what? It's not. And we can all relate to this with home improvement projects, right? But like, there is a wall, there's paint, there's carpet. He can, there's space to live, but there's no ceiling. Uh, the closet's not cased out. And you know why? It's not because I'm lazy, per se. It's because I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to do a drop ceiling. I'm going to figure it out, but I don't know how. And because I don't know how, what becomes easy for me to do? Push it off, right? Are you with me? Have you ever been there? Like, when you don't know how to do something, it'd just be convenient to, like, not do it. Like, oh, I'll just take care of something else because thinking about learning how to do something, it's, it gets a little exhausting sometimes, and it's just been easy for me to say, oh, that's a whole thing, and it can just wait. He's, he's good with four choices, right? Uh, I don't know if he is or not. We haven't talked about it lately, but. Knowing how is huge. And so this summer, as we're walking through, uh, hopefully uh, thinking about, growing in our understanding of, allowing the Spirit to, to just form and fashion and shape our hearts and minds about this, this gift of prayer, the hope is that by the end of the summer, that God in his wisdom through his word, who calls us to prayer, who gives us this gift, to Jesus says men always ought to pray, right? Always ought to pray. And the, the reason why I stand up here and talk to you about prayer, the number one reason is because Jesus believed in prayer and practiced prayer. And as I follow him, I realize that if he understood that the value and meaning and purpose of his life was full and was meaningful and worked out in the will of God in his life as he prayed, then surely little old Chip, who is not anywhere close, right, to the divine son of God, should pray. There's something to that. But what's cool about God is he not only calls us to this, gives us this gift, but he then comes along and says, hey, hey, I want to show you how to do this. Because he understands that we are we're so often like that. We, we, we realize something, but often when we don't quite know how to do something, we avoid it. We put it off. We do something else because we're uncertain. We're unsure about what that looks like. As I said last week, man, um, I haven't met anybody yet in my whole life, and I don't think I'm ever going to meet anybody yet who just looks at you and said, listen, I know exactly everything about prayer, and I'm tapping out on that to its complete potential, right? 
No one's ever. It's just one of those things about life that, yes, I, I see this, this reality that God has for me. This, I keep calling it a gift. It's a gift to be able to have direct communication with the creator of the universe is a gift. It's something that you and I don't deserve. And it's, it's not something that like, well, if you have a certain IQ level, then you can maybe have a conversation with God. Or if you live a certain lifestyle or have a certain character, you can have a conversation with, no, God graciously has given all of us this ability to, to communicate with him. It's a gift. And so often, just like, not unlike communication and relationships in our lives, we struggle with how to do that. And what's beautiful is the Lord in his wisdom gives us the blueprint, the map. He comes alongside us and said, here's the gift, but here, I'm gonna show you how to use the gift that I've given to you. My hope as pastor is that when July finishes, that we all have allowed the Holy Spirit to just grow us a little bit or give us a new perspective or open our understanding. Or maybe the spirit just in this series, maybe you know everything we're gonna talk about. You're an expert in the model of prayer, the Lord's prayer. But it's just a chance for the Lord to once again show you, hey, how desperately you need this as a first thing and not a last resort, amen? That's the hope in this summer that we would we would get it. And so here's the text that we're, we're walking through this summer. Matthew 6, verse 5. And when you pray. Guess what? This word when is going to be repeated because it's obvious that Jesus, as he's sharing in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, assumes that anybody who would want to be connected to God, who would want to be in relationship with God, who has a relationship with God, then what is present in their life is a prayer life. It's a when, not an if, right? When, not if. That's one of the first things we talked about last week was when, not if. When you pray, and then he's like, listen, all around you, you've seen poor models. You struggle to understand prayer because there's so many wacky ideas and practices out there about prayer. It's gotten so out of whack that you shrink back from it often or you don't lean into it like you should because it's like, well, I've seen this and I've seen that. And he gives two vivid illustrations to help us understand what to avoid when we think about having a vibrant, healthy, ongoing prayer life. He says, first of all, do not be like hypocrites, the hypocrites, the religious people who had taken this gift from God and where it was supposed to be a way that they had relationship with God and they communicated and had fellowship with God and they had turned it into something that was uh, self-centered. It was, it was a way to um, uh, make themselves look good. It was a way to justify in their own mind, their own standing. This is what religion always does. Religion is always a comparison game. Religion thrives on how good you can look or what you, you, you're following me, right? And he said, you've even take, you've taken prayer, this gift, this privilege God has given to mankind to be able to talk with the Almighty, and you've actually distorted it. So now you try to use prayer as a way to look good in front of others. Yeah, that's kind of what we do with a lot of things. And he says, listen, what people have done is they, they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. We've taken that which God has used for his glory. The more I interact with God, it's going to glorify him, right? And his glory is going to come out of that. And you've taken what is supposed to glorify him and you're trying to use it to glorify yourself. You've perverted it. And no wonder you don't understand prayer. You shrink back from prayer. You have questions about prayer because when you walk down the street and you see these godly people using this gift of prayer to like stand there for a long time and make a big spectacle and create some big ceremony. So prayer is not like that. Prayer is not meant for any other person except for God himself. We get that? 
Prayer is not meant for anybody. The audience of prayer is God himself. And so he says, we talked about that, that, that prayer is conversation, not ceremony, right? It's when, not if, conversation, not ceremony. Truly, I tell you that these people that practice this, they have received their reward in full. You know what? They're not really going to get answers to prayer. They're just going to get the applause of men. That sounds like you're getting shortchanged. I kind of would rather God answer my prayers than somebody come along and say, attaboy. Yeah. Right? It doesn't really change my life, except for it just makes me feel better about myself and look better in front of others. He said, that's their reward. They look good, or they seem to look good. But when you pray, here we go, when, go into your room, close the door, pray to your father who is unseen. Somebody asked a great question after first service. I love it. People are just asking questions about this. It's, it's so fun to see people interact with the word of God. And they're like, well, is prayer just supposed to be done in secret? Like you read that, you talked about that. They said, well, what about praying together? Why do we pray? You know, I was like, that's a great question. And guess what? In this series, we're gonna walk into that. And I said, guess what prayer is? It's, it's not an either or, secret or in public. It's a both and. If the only time I ever pray is by myself, then I'm missing God's purpose of prayer. If the only time I'm praying is with somebody else and never by myself, I'm missing it. It's a both and, not an either or. But Jesus is, is trying to call them to understand that prayer is deeply personal in nature and that it can be done without the help of a religious leader or uh, it, it can be done just you. And in fact, that where it thrives is when it is uninterrupted, unhindered with just the Father, right? Jesus, if you read the Gospels, did what often? He got alone. Did he pray with his disciples? Yes. Did he pray with people? Yes. What did he also do? He got alone. In fact, it would seem to understand his life is that those times alone were very valuable to what he was doing. And so he's saying, listen, grab a hold of this prayer. When you pray, go into your room, close the door, pray to your father. Have this conversation with your father. Then your father, who sees what is done in secret, I love this word, will. Will. Not may, will. I said this in first service. Are you like me? Like I desire so badly to see my life littered with answers to prayer. I, I just want that so badly. I want to be able to say, you know, like, hey, guess what God did? Like, just littered with answers to prayer all over. I was, I was talking about last night, Nicole and I went to a, a, a concert um, and just had a blast. It's her and I for this weekend. The kids are in West Virginia. woo <laughs> I don't know if they're watching. I doubt it, but uh, yeah. we miss them very badly. <laughs> We're just sitting around waiting for them to come home. So we go to a concert, great concert down in Columbus. And, you know, we were driving home and talking about the concert and just the different personalities that were singing and their emphasis, you know. And one guy just particularly, you know, just really calling us to, 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 to seek out the power of God in prayer. And Nicole was sharing with me again. I, I, I knew this story, but she was just sharing me again. Like, uh, Nicole, when she was about seven years old, um, had been in the hospital um, for a little stay, and she had come home, and you know how they, the, the wristband they give you, right? They don't really, they don't take that off. I don't know why they do that. Or do they do that now? I haven't been in for a while, so I hopefully am not headed there this week. But like, it's hard to get off, right? And um, so seven-year-old Nicole, just trying to get it off, goes into the kitchen and gets a knife. She just came from the hospital, all right? And can you imagine? She puts the knife in like this and pulls up. 
and it slips, and she cuts herself right here into her eye. They rush her to the hospital. And it's not good. The first doctor who, they're, it's not good. I mean, it's slashed and the eye, okay. My mother-in-law is a little panicked, not just because of that also, but if you know my wife, she was born 10 months premature, 10 months. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, they're going to do a documentary on us. You can watch it on Discovery Channel. But um, 10 weeks, eight or 10 weeks premature, right? And um, so one thing that had happened in her being premature, her, her hearing, her ears did not fully develop. And if you know that about my wife, you know she has, she's hearing impaired because of that. And my mother-in-law was like desperate, not only just for the sake of the eye, but to realize that Nicole functions, like her eyesight is super important to even be able to communicate. Like if she can't see, her hearing is really, like you don't realize it, but she can read your lips. So if you're talking across the lobby, beware. She's really good. And she does what some young new Christian only knows to do. She calls the pastor. And she's desperate. She said, can you come pray? And Pastor McCoy comes up. And I'm sure Pastor McCoy would, would tell you like he didn't have a market on prayer. But he prayed. And he prayed that God would heal her. And you know what? Yeah. That doctor came in, the second doctor and he came out and he looked at him and said, I don't know what you guys are talking about. Her eye is fine. And I know this is hard for us to understand. And I've prayed for things at times and it hasn't happened. And I get it. But the idea is that the scriptures call us to ask and believe and trust. And I promise you, that you and I's lives can be littered with stories of answered prayer. Because he says, then your father who sees what is done in secret will, will reward you. And when you pray, there it is again, don't keep on babbling like pagans. So you, you look at prayer, how do I pray? And, and you see all of these pagan religions and and. They, they try to talk to their God and they think they have some formula that if they, 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 they say the same words over and over and over. Does that sound like? Anyway. Does that, do you have to like pray for a couple hours or half a day? Uh, they had this whole idea that, that the gods were distant and angry and you had to do something very worthwhile or sacrificial to finally get them to do something, right? And so they remember Elijah on Mount Carmel for all day, they're just, they're cutting themselves and they're trying to do all these things and Elijah waltzes in and in 60 words calls fire down from heaven. So don't be like the pagans around you. Don't think, like I said last week, that there's a secret formula. God desires sincerity, not secret formula. Longer is not stronger. Thank the Lord, right? Some of you need to remind me of that on Sunday mornings, I know. <laughs> Do not be like them, for your Father knows, listen to these words, what you need before you ask him. That's an important phrase because evidently in prayer, there is, a, there is a reality that God in his wisdom and his ability to know already knows what the right thing is. He knows what we have need of. We're not surprising him. Oh yeah, that's a good idea. I should have thought of that. It's never gonna come out of God's right? He already knows. And yet there's a, and it's almost like it's telling us that like, he's like holding out on us. He just wants to be with us. He wants us to treat prayer, not as some kind of, you know, gumball machine 
put the quarter in, get the gum. He wants us to treat prayer as something greater than that, that it's actually time spent with him in this relational communion and fellowship. He already knows what you need. He just wants to spend time with you. It's kind of what he's pushing toward. This then is how. Here's that word, how. That's this summer, how, how. When you pray, how do I do that? This then is, it's written in a word, in a way that it's like Jesus is saying, I wanna teach you about prayer and I'm gonna teach you a prayer. Now, I'm not telling you that this is like the secret formula, like the pagans. Like, okay, so I'm gonna give you these 60 something words and I just want you to say these 10 times a day. You know, not like a prescription. Take two pills, drink some water, and this is, that's not what this is. It's a model, not a script. The script does provide the framework, the foundation, the bones, the skeleton. Like Jesus is calling us and giving us this ability to to navigate through prayer in an effective, powerful way. But it's not like, hey, you learn the script, say it 20 times, boom, you've you've realized prayer. Would you think that if I just only prayed, every time I got up, I just said the Lord's Prayer, that's all I said. The next time I got up, I said the Lord's Prayer, that's all I said. And like, like we sat down at the table and I said the Lord's Prayer, that's all I said. When I met with you and like the camera guys were like, man, you move around a lot. First service, so I'm trying to be cautious. Um, like, you would say, like, something's broke. Like, I'm not sure you quite understand prayer. If you just keep saying the Lord's Prayer every time. It's a model, not a script. But this model, this foundation, the bones of this, if we'll put the flesh on it, it is amazing. And so let's launch in this first week. I want to just look at the first line. I want us to think about what God is teaching us, the Lord is teaching us about prayer. And it's in this simple line, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And I wanna make two points. I'm gonna tell you the points I wanna make right now so you can chew on it. First of all, I want us to understand that he teaches us that prayer is born in relationship. Born in relationship. Our Father. Amen? Amen. Like prayer is a relational type activity, not a religious observance or duty. Jesus modeled this. He started his prayers, not like, oh, immortal, immortal, invisible, God only wise. Thou great deity of the... How did Jesus always start his prayer? Father, Father. You'd be like, I think that guy is in a relationship, right? Like the only time he does not say Father in prayer in Scripture is when he is sin-bearing on the cross. The only time. He always said Father except for that one time when he said, my God, my God. He's in such emotional trauma then that it's tough, right? But I always said, Father. Prayer is born in relationship. To talk to you about prayer, to teach on how to pray is all stupid and a waste of your time if you don't realize that prayer is the outflow, it's the natural communication of a relationship. Our Father. Our, in this prayer, you're not going to see I, me, and mine. If you look at your prayer life and you see a lot of I, me, and mine, maybe God's trying to teach you that actually our lives are meant to be lived way bigger than me, mine, and I. That even in prayer, we realize that as I'm praying for God, absolutely, give us this day our daily bread, physical needs. Forgive us our trespasses, this spiritual, this mental, this emotional. Lead us not into temptation. Uh, All these things that I need, but I need them for something greater than my own thing. 
that actually God is teaching us in prayer that as we pray in our own lives for things, that it's for the benefit of something bigger than me. You see, even in this prayer, it's like this tap into uh, love God with all your mind, soul, strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. I need God's help, his provision, so that then I can love others and show others the love of God. Do you see like there's this breakdown? Prayer is, it's community in nature, not like so individualistic. Our Father. Now, Father is this relationship type language. It's the Greek word is not the word that Jesus used. Jesus spoke in Aramaic uh, and the Bible was translated and written in Greek. And so there's no doubt in our minds that when Jesus was sharing this sermon in in Aramaic, that he used this word, Abba. I don't know the Aramaic word for our, so I'm going to use English. Our Abba. I just really butchered everything. (laughs) Our Abba. The crazy thing about this is that is one of the most endearing, intimate words that he could have used. It literally translates for us now, daddy. Isn't it the most beautiful thing when your kids call you daddy or mommy? It's just, ah, melt your heart, run through a wall, kind of, right? Think about as he's talking to people who what they know about God has been formed through the Old Testament. What they know about gods are formed by the religions around them, distant, stern, impersonal. It says prayer is prayed in the context of a relationship where you say, Daddy. You know communication's important in relationships, right? I shared first service, and I did okay. I didn't say too much, but I was sharing about my first year of marriage. My wife was in there, so she's gone now, so we can really talk freely. (laughs) I can tell the whole truth, and no. Like, man, we jumped in. We got married within a year of meeting each other. Probably not advisable. So the first year we were married, I mean, we lived in this apartment in Sparta, Michigan. And the memories I have of that is uh, a lot of things, but uh, fighting was one of them, just to be honest. Like, we have a great marriage. It's just growing and growing. But that first year we fought like crazy, like cats and dogs. The two becoming one concept was, it's hard, right? Especially initially, especially when you hardly know the person. Um, and so I remember there would be nights where maybe something was said or, you know, an action or an attitude, right? (laughs) If you're married, you know what I'm talking about. Like communication is far more than verbal, right? Men, (laughs) there is tone and there is body language. (laughs) And you don't have to say anything. I feel it. And so we'd have one of those days where maybe I said something and, or she's, who are we kidding? It was always me. But. And I remember we'd, we'd go to bed. Now, maybe this is TMI. Okay, I don't care. But like, we are a spooning couple. That's how we start to fall asleep, right? So you're like, I don't need to know this about you. But I'm making a point here, all right? And she's the big spoon, I'm the little spoon. No, I'm teasing. (laughs) No. So we generally like start that way and then you kind of sleep the way you need to. But um, like those nights, we, we just would get in bed and our backs would be to one another. You know what I'm talking about, married people. And there's just this, you know, it's very clear. Nothing said, but communication is non-existent because there is hurt, right? 
And I remember nights. I mean, we're, we love each other. We, we are all in on this. And, and, but like, we're just having trouble. And like, I would lay there for sometimes 30 minutes, 40 minutes. I'm too stubborn. And she's definitely too stubborn. <laughs> Joking. And we just lay there and we weren't sleeping. I guess we were acting like it. But the whole time is like, you know, And finally, one of us would be like, can we just fix this? I remember probably more than a few nights that first year, 1.30, 2 o'clock in the morning. The light comes on, and we're talking about it and getting back to where relationship, communication, right? Right? And in communication with the Father, the scriptures say that he's a jealous God. Like, he's jealous for you. He desires time with you. When you you ignore him, or even as the scriptures say, when you do things that hurt him, like, it affects your prayer life. David said, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Like Isaiah, I quoted this. This is a powerful verse. Listen to this. Isaiah said this, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ears too dull to hear. He's capable. He never fails. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your self-centered lifestyle has made you to turn your back to hurt God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear, right? And so relationship in prayer is primary and this is a relational type thing and God is calling us to be sincere and cooperative and it's this this relationship where I love him and he loves me, and that becomes the basis for a vibrant, healthy prayer life. What I'm trying to say is, like, to think that I'm going to be effective in prayer, and prayer is going to be this gift that God gives me, and it's effective in my life, but I ignore God all week, and I do things contrary to his will and his ways, and I live according to my own things. The idea that all, like, I just come in and say, hey, Father, I need this, is crazy, right? There's not a relationship. It's hurt. Now, when I talk about this, I can sense in the room like, oh, geez. So what you're telling me now is if I I don't make any mistakes, then I can count on prayer working. But, and I would remind you of these next words, our Father, which art in heaven. This is a relationship unlike any other. This is a God who is capable of a love that is constant. I mean, I try my best with my kids. I really do. But there's times when after the fifth time, the frustration comes out in my voice, right? Who am I kidding? It's after the third time. I'm sorry. (laughs) And they they feel that, right? I, I, I feel bad about that later. Like, but they're like, oh, you know, like, but God is not like us. That's why it uses illustrations of scripture like earthly fathers do their best, but can you imagine a father that is perfect? And they do their best, but he gets it right. And in this relationship, what he desires is simply for us to keep turning to him. Even in the middle of failure, even in the middle of maybe a sin or a lack of trust or doubt, our father God here I am. And it's not performance-based. It's not like you get to pray if you've, you know, got all the merits. It's relationally based. And we are in relationship with a God who has a constant covenant love toward us. His demeanor does not change. Now, we can walk away from that, right? But he doesn't change. He's always inviting us to depend and lean on him. The second phrase is, hallowed be your name. Hallowed. 
It's not a word we use very much, is it? It carries with this idea of extraordinary. It's making an ordinary thing extraordinary, to make a common thing uncommon. It's basically this idea that as we come into prayer with this Father, this God, we are very cognizant of who we're coming to. This is a great fear of mine that we've created a fishing buddy God in Jesus in our culture. God is my bro, right? God is not your bro. He is way more than your bro. He is the infinite creator of the universe. I mean, he is hallowed. It carries with this idea of holy. He is other. He is not like you or me. Thank God. And what's genius about this is as he's teaching us how to pray, he wants us to, instead of coming in and say, God, I need this. Help me with that. Give me wisdom. I need some whatever. It's like prayer is actually flows best when as we come into this relationship kind of activity, our Father, that our minds and hearts are very in tune with who we're coming to. I've actually experienced that as I've allowed God to shape my prayer life in this way, and as I come into his presence and I spend time thinking about who he is, his nature, his character, his goodness, his faithfulness, his love, all of these things, as I have stopped my thing and allowed my heart, man, there's been times I really needed God to do something. Like I'm desperate. And yet knowing the the rhythm of the one I'm coming before. You know what? By by the time I have allowed my heart to dwell on who he is, by the time I get to what I'm wanting, it's almost like, it's almost like it's not like, oh God, I hope you can do this for me. It's like when I've filled myself with the knowledge of God, when I've, when I've focused on who he is, his character, his otherness, and in that otherness, this constant love and this desire for my good and all this stuff, that by the time I sometimes get to my knees, I'm like, hey, you got this. I'm not even worried about it anymore because I know who you are. Think about this. The scene in heaven right now is God's name is honored and adored in unceasing worship. But the scene on earth, well, Isaiah said this, continually all the day my name is despised. Earth could not be more different than heaven. In heaven, God's name is honored. On earth, God's name is despised. And God is teaching us that you live in a world that's broken and fallen, is running from the knowledge of God, is running from the sufficiency of God, is placing all their eggs in the we can figure out, we can do it basket, that he teaches us in prayer that we chase those things away in our hearts and minds. We honor the name of God for what really is. That in a world where he is downplayed, he is forgotten, he is not seen for who he is, that in prayer we refresh ourselves by focusing and hallowing his name. Amen? Amen? And my challenge to you this week is, if you don't do this, give it a shot. Intentionally this week in prayer, don't ask for anything, but just worship God. Think about who he is, what he does, what he's done in your life. Just sit there. I promise you by the time you get to your needs, your daily bread and your trespasses and temptation and all those things, that your ability to believe in God's provision in your life will be so much higher because you know who you're talking to. Hallowed be your name. You know, names are important. Isn't it frustrating when somebody doesn't remember your name? Kind of frustrating, right? I'm walking through that with you guys right now, and I I hate it. I hate it. I just want to know every one of your names. I really do. And just just be patient with me. That's why I ask you, help me, because I really desire to know your name, because knowing a name is important. 
Like there's something about knowing someone's name. My uncle, I got to tell this story. It's 1156. I'm going to be done here in three minutes. I promise. My uncle, my uncle was a radio personality, traveled the country, knew thousands and thousands of people, and he knew too many people. He couldn't keep it all straight, right? And so he developed this habit where he would be like, he'd run into somebody, he knew a face, but he had no idea what their name was, and he'd be like, hey, man, and he'd be like, how do you spell your name again? It worked out great for him. They'd be like, oh, yeah, you know, like, and it kind of, until that one day, he walked up to this guy. This guy looked at him. He's like, hey, Rex. That's my uncle's name. And he's like, hey, man, how do you spell your name? And the guy's whole demeanor changed. And he went, B-O-B. <laughs> and the whole game was over, right? Like, you didn't know who I was. Stop that. You didn't forget. You just didn't know. B-O-B, you know. Name's important. And in this prayer, hallowed be your name. Think about all the names of God in Scripture and what they mean. And how in the world could we have a conversation with God himself without allowing the framework of how we understand who we're coming toward to not be filled with this other, the one that is not like us, but in the fact of his goodness and love, that is the greatest thing in the world. That the one that is not like us is able to do those things that we cannot. Father, help us as we pray. Teach us how. Lord, I really pray that over these six weeks or so that we would just grow some. We would entertain the word and we would allow it to strengthen this gracious, beautiful gift that you've given to us, this ability to change the world through prayer. Make it so. Teach us how. And all God's people said, amen. Told you, 1159.